right, so a, a quick intro to the Campus and Community Coalition. Um, it's a terrific group, and uh, I, I've been acquainted with them for a long time. We're excited to have them here today. The CCC works to promote responsible decision-making about alcohol and other drug use. They identify factors supporting high-risk and illegal drinking, analyze data, and implement proven and promising strategies to create positive change. And they really have over their six years. Is it six or seven? Eight. Eight. Eight years. They've done quite a bit uh, in bridging some, um, some, well, coming up with some great strategies and, and bridging some divides between campus and community. Together, they seek to improve the health, safety, and well-being of our communities. <coughs> University and community leaders with support from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism come together to form the Campus and Community Coalition to reduce high-risk drinking in 2005. Since its inception, students' risky drinking is down by as much as 26%, and the comprehensive strategic plan which drives the efforts is garnering national recognition. It is a poster child for a lot of campus community coalitions throughout the country. Um, at this time, I'm going to bring up Sally Manowski, the Assistant Dean of Student Affairs. It's always fun to be talking about drinking at eight in the morning, right? Um, so thank you, thank you for the for the kind welcome. We're really happy to be here this morning to tell you a little bit about the work that we are doing as a university and as a community to change the drinking culture um, that affects not only our college students but our high school students and our community at, at large. So um, to begin with, um, we don't, I don't have a remote, so it's just going to be kind of awkward if you do the next slide. Um, we are an award-winning coalition. We formed our campus and community coalition in 2005. Before that, there had been a lot of uh, initiatives trying to look at the problems of student drinking and conduct and misbehavior <laughs> in neighborhoods and sort of similar things to what we hear today. But there wasn't necessarily a strategic approach. There was a lot of this sort of pointing fingers and this is your problem, this is your problem and a lot of wringing of hands. In 2005, we had an opportunity through Boston University to join a campus community, a campus community partnership initiative, which the only thing you had to do to join was be an institution of higher education, to commit to collect data on your campus for five years, to sign up to go through a strategic planning session based on a public health model and be a high binge drinking campus. <laughs> so we fit the bill. Um, and uh, we, we signed up to be one of the campuses. We were part of the coalition initiative with MIT, Clark, uh, Boston University, and who was our last one? Gosh, I can't remember. Um, uh, at any rate, and, and one other campus. and. It was, it was really changed the way that we address these problems in our community forever. Uh, why do we care about college drinking? Next slide, please. The images are around us all the time, and it's important to remember that these messages that we stop seeing, our young people see every single day. When they come into a community, they see things, they have a perception of what college drinking is like, and we as adults do as well. If I were to say keg party, or uh, round robin, or um, house party, when you were in college, or when you were a young person, it conjures up some images, doesn't it? You remember how it was. And so we all sort of have those stories, and what we're here to tell you is it's different today. College drinking, young person's drinking, is not like it was when we were, um, when we were at their age. So um, the images are around us all the time. They see it, we see it, and so it's, it's a constant battle. In thinking about Amherst, thinking about the University of Massachusetts, it's important to contextualize. Why is the University of Massachusetts considered a heavy drinking school? One of the things we talk about is the state sets the rate. In public health, we know very well that young people drink like the adults in their community. This chart, I, I like, I don't have my pointer with me, but you can see the dark red um, is the highest level of binge drinking in, among adults in 2009 by the National Survey of Drug Use and Health uh, done by one of our federal agencies. So Massachusetts is in the top fifth of states 
for binge drinking among teens, among adults, among elderly. So that raises the boat, if, if you follow me. What that means is that we are a high binge state. So whenever someone says to us at the coalition, well, you know, what about Texas? They don't have the same problems that we have. We have to situate ourselves within the state, within Amherst, Amherst area, rural, public, northeast, division one, Greek system, those are all risk factors at the institution level that make an institution more likely to have a, a higher binge rate. So in understanding the problem, there's, there's multiple levels um, to address. How do we get started in this work and what drives our work? Science drives our work. The National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism in 2002 came out with this awesome resource, a call to action. It was the first time that the heads of all the public health agencies in alcohol abuse fields came together and said, what do we know about college drinking? They did a meta review of the, of the literature. They put things together in terms of what are effective strategies, and they ranked them for us. Tier one is the highest level of effectiveness. Tier four is no evidence of effectiveness in changing behavior or consequences. And then they released this broadly to college presidents. It changed the field, but sadly, it, that was 2002. It's been updated in 2011. They checked in with presidents and, and colleges and communities to see how many of those recommended strategies have been implemented. Fewer than 16% of campuses have a campus and community coalition. So it's really, really impressive that our, that our towns and that our university has come together and maintained a coalition for so long uh, because the science has not been adopted. We have adopted the science and we've made some significant, uh, some significant improvements. So when we think about drinking, we often think of the individual and individual choice. So what makes an individual choose to drink in high risk ways or stupid ways or destructive ways? Are disturbing ways. The reality is individual choice never happens just individually. It happens within a context of an environment. So the approach we take is called environmental management. It's a public health, health ecological approach, looking at all of the factors in a community, in a, in, within an individual as well, that, define, that help define or shape the drinking patterns. Next slide. So we take a systems approach, and this is sort of a busy chart, but the reason I like it is it shows that in order to change a drinking culture in any community, in any population, you need to have interventions and strategies at every single level of this circle. So you can work at the individual level with screening, um, awareness, skill develop development, uh, brief motivational interventions, so things for individuals who are drinking in high-risk ways. But if that is all you do, you're pulling one person out of the stream at a time without ever looking at what, push, what is pushing them into the stream. You know, it's putting someone back into the polluted stream. At the interpersonal level, uh, there are things like parent engagement, uh, working with first year students, working with groups of students that are at, particularly at high risk, such as athletes or Greek members. Um, and peer levels. At the institutional level, that is things within the institution itself, so prevention policies, communication and awareness, consistence enforcement, faculty engagement, promotion of healthy norms, and then at the community level, and that's where all of you um, are, are situated as well. It, it has to do with alcohol availability and access, it's just hard for me to see over here, community partnership, um, joint ju jurisdiction with local police, sober host trainings and laws. So the point here is most campuses focus right here at the individual <laughs> level. And so the impact in the community is not felt. And the community factors which are, which are posing risk to the young people are not addressed as well. So, so how, do we, how do we sort of work to solve this problem? Uh, we walk, work long and hard. Nicely, the, um, the NIAAA report sort of categorized strategies for us, and there's basically five strategies that have been shown with young people to reduce high-risk drinking. One is limiting alcohol availabil availability. That means making it not available as much as possible to underage people. Um, limiting overconsumption for people who are of age. Watching where alcohol is available. The more places where alcohol is available in your community, even for legitimate uses, it sends a message in terms of, do, do you need to drink in a movie? I don't know. 
But for a young person, oh, it sort of becomes culturally accepted. Now you can go to um, SeaWorld, and, and there's Bush, and Anheuser-Busch everywhere. When we grow up, when we grew up, it was, you know, hot dogs and Coke. And now you can have a beer at SeaWorld. Is it wrong to have a beer at SeaWorld? I don't know. But it sort of, it sort of sends a message. Uh, restricting alcohol marketing and promotion. The number one market for, for heavy drinkers is young people aged 18 to 35. The alcohol industry targets those individuals. So we try to look at reducing marketing and promotion specifically that targets young people. What we know with the brain development is late brain doesn't stop growing until the age of 25. That's something that's different too. We can no longer stand to have, a, to have people that are 18, 19, 20, 21 drinking to high levels of alcohol abuse because of what we know with the science, what it does to the brain. Um, offering alcohol free social and recreational <coughs> options, increasing policy and law enforcement, and changing the normative environment and, and correcting misperceptions. So if we have activities within these different strategies, we can work towards holistically changing the system, changing the environment. We know that the impact of, of student drinking on the campus, vandalism, um, violence, hangovers, regretted actions, missing class, individual factor things, the academic reputation, academic success, progress. What about in the community? Well, obviously the impact of student drinking in the community is large as well. There's litter, there's vandalism. Noise is the number one complaint related to drinking. I think the, the police would, um, would support that as well, is that it, it's when people are drunk, they're noisy. And when they're in groups, they're noisy. Uh, disturbing the peace, increased public service costs um, for breaking up parties, for dealing with accidents, um, that sort of thing. And just the, the peaceful enjoyment of our community. So we're, so we're all invested. Um, so we formed a coalition to come together to look at implementing strategies. We started with the data. What are the problems in our community? We're really fortunate in a lot of ways. We're in the state of Massachusetts. We don't have happy hour legislation. That is really good because young people's drinking is sensitive to price. That's one of the most effective things is if you raise the price of alcohol, consumption drops, particularly for young people. So we don't have happy hours. We don't have nickel nights. We don't have things that other communities like Nebraska, University of Nebraska had to struggle with. Um, so we come together, we look at the data, and then we sort of hone in on what are the particular problems in our community. Our members are, are, are broad and wide, and we're uh, gaining members all the time. On the left-hand side are the University of Massachusetts members, and on the right-hand side are some of our community stakeholders. We have local area government. We have alcoholic beverage retailers. We have, whoa, Lisa's got a hyper. Um, fire department, health department, towns of Hadley, Amherst, and Sunderland in, are involved, and we're, we're a solution-oriented group. <coughs> Um, and we're also a place where we can vent frustrations, um, hit on trends that are happening, and work together collaboratively. We don't have a huge budget, but we have people power, we have passion, and we come together. And, and that's um, really important. We have a brochure um, on the table over the table is, yeah, in the back table that has our membership, so you can see. <coughs> now you can use that. <laughs> Um, this is a little public health jargon, which basically sort of reflects that systems approach, if you remember that circle. Um, in order to combat a, a drinking culture, you need to have interventions across the spectrum of prevention. So most campuses will focus at the very tippy top of the, of the, of the um, triangle here with individuals who already have problems and do very little at this level. This is public policy, this is universal prevention things that will shift a drinking culture for everybody, even for the individuals who don't drink. So I know it's hard to see, so I really won't focus on it, but the bottom line is you want to have a majority of your interventions over here that affect everybody. Um, you want to have support and interventions for people that are already experiencing consequences and support for individuals in recovery. We have a collegiate recovery community at UMass Amherst, um, which we're really excited about. Um, but you need to really focus a lot of your work here. And what that does is shift the needle of drinking in the population. Next slide. So speaking of, of shifting the needle, these are some of our highlights. Um, and it's, it's really impressive 
to sort of to look at. The bottom slide here is the national rate of binge drinking. Binge drinking is five drinks in a row for men or four in a row for females over a two week period. So what you'll see is in 2005 when we started our coalition, our heavy episodic or binge drinking rate was about 59% um, at the University of Massachusetts. So almost two thirds of our students were drinking in very high risk ways. And you'll see a steady decrease. This has been a statistically significant decrease um, since 2005. The national rate you'll see is 40% and it's hovering between 40, 41, and 39%. Are we higher than the national rate? Yeah, we sure are. And go back and think about the state slide that I showed you. But we're moving in the right direction. Next slide. Underage. Underage binge drinking has been a primary focus of our coalition and we're really excited to see a 27% decline in our underage binge drinking rates. Um, I don't have a national rate here because this is interesting. Um, the, there is no standard survey that is done on campus colleges anymore since Harvard College uh, alcohol study ended in 2007. So there is no consistent measure. So I don't have an underage binge rate to report in the same way that we do. Um, but the fact that we're seeing decreases is great. Our frequent binge rate, so that remember the five and four? These are folks who do this three or more times in the past two weeks. These are the heavy hitters. These are the culture custodians, the ones who host the parties um, and the ones who can set the tone. You've seen a 56% decrease in our frequent binge rate at the university, which we're really excited about. And I do have the national norm here. It's 15%. So I'm happy to say that we are at the national level now. That is, that is good. But we have to monitor this. We do surveys every year to sort of look at what are the risk groups and that sort of thing. Yes. I saw in all of those, there's a huge drop between 2010 and 2011. What happened? We're not sure. Yeah, we're not sure what happened in that year. Um, because it's, it's a one year sort of difference, um, we did have a lot more females respond that year than, than males to the survey, but we, we couldn't explain it. So, next slide. And, and now let me introduce Lisa Queenan, my co-chair. So I've been part of the coalition now for two years, and, and Sally said she's been here uh, from the start, many of the other folks you'll hear from on our panel have also been here from the beginning. So um, I wanted just to talk a little bit about some of the successes that we've had since the start of the CCC. And early on, the coalition decided to focus a lot of, of time and attention on uh, policy and enforcement. As they assessed sort of what was happening in the community or not happening, they realized this was certainly an area for improvement looking at both campus policies related to alcohol as well as um, municipal bylaws and their enforcement. So there was room for improvement. There were also models to consider from other states, in particular college communities that we could look at. And I think there was an appetite among students in the survey. They expressed that they thought some of the policies were too lenient and could be more, um, could be stricter. So this was an area that the coalition focused quite a bit on, which you'll see reflected in some of the um, the outcomes over the years. So I wanted to just um, touch upon a few, and again, the, the brochure that we have also covers some of this. But um, as far as outcomes on campus, um, the Code of Student Conduct uh, has been updated several times since the coalition formed. And I'll just point out a couple things that I think are really important to note. Um, and you may already know this, but the Code of Student Conduct applies to behavior that occurs on campus as well as off campus. It really follows the student. So when I say off campus, it's not just in the immediate neighborhood, but also if they're at a football game or um, at a party at Hampshire College, um, the code follows the student and they're um, responsible for their actions no matter where they are. And that's a very important piece that's been clarified. Um, I think the expectations and the consequences are more clearly articulated now in the code. And another thing that is a more recent change is that um, it now clarifies that any violation of state or local law is a violation of the code. And before that, it was um, if a student violated you know, a local law, they might have to try to fit in, see where it could fit in into you know, the code. But now it's just very clearly stated that any violation of local or state law is a violation of the code. And students will be held accountable both for their actions in the community with municipal outcomes as well as on campus. Um, along those same lines, there have been improvements in the campus judicial system. So not only um, 
not only upholding our students to higher standards, but also um, implementing consequences for students. And so those are, more, those are clearer to students now. Um, they're also happening sooner. In the last year and a half, the Venus Students Office has made a real um, dent in making sure students are seen close to when their infraction occurred. So that's down to like two weeks to a month that if, you know, I and mean, that's really important for students in deterring behavior that they go in and have to meet with the dean of students and face consequences pretty soon after they're um, they maybe caught doing something. So there have been some, some major improvements in that too. Um, the basics program is a, a evidence-based screening and intervention tool for students and it's now any student that violates alcohol policy, um, any student that is uh, taken into protective custody, or seen through the courts is now mandated to go through the basics program. And there's basics one, two, and three, depending you know, for your first um, interaction with basics, and then two and three. Um, students can also self-select self to go through the basics program if they feel like it would be a beneficial thing for them. Um, there is a cost associated with that as well for the student. Um, as Sally mentioned, we've established a collegiate recovery community. There are now um, parent and student information sessions that are new student orientation, so really trying to think of ways to engage parents in the conversation, and there are other educational things that we do with students. As far as the um, municipal outcomes, um, as you all know, there's been early on, both Amherst and Hadley adopted some new bylaws. They looked at models from, from other places, so the nuisance house bylaw, the keg registration, open container, and then um, also a little bit later on, decided to increase the penalties to, to sort of make, make, make students feel, that, feel in the pocket, so increasing them from $50 or $100 to now $300 across the board. Um, and students can also be issued, issued multiple um, citations, so some students, as, as I'm sure you've seen in the, in the paper, they may face $600, $900 in, in fines. Um, there's been, uh, there's mutual aid between UMass Police Department and other municipal forces. There's been some joint patrols between UMass Police and Amherst Police, and they can certainly speak more about this. Targeted enforcement initiatives, DUI checkpoints, or shops, uh, cops and shops. Also, um, the Amherst Police do a particularly good job of really tracking and monitoring problem houses, and particularly before the fall and the spring, they'll do some um, targeted outreach to those houses. Um, just to kind of give them a heads up, explain what they're going to be doing, um, and, and kind of give them a little bit of advance warning uh, before uh, we get into the spring or into the fall. Partnering with retailers to reduce over service and underage consumption, and careful review of liquor licenses, given that the select board is the local licensing authority. Um, I think you know the, the select board certainly uh, looks for input from the CCC when it's considering whether or not to issue a license and whether or not this community you know, needs more, um, as, as Sally said, sort of greater control of alcohol. Um, I won't go into any depth through this, but this is just a few of the strategies. So obviously, high visibility is a, a really important piece, um, letting students know what the local laws are. I mean, they all come from different communities around the state or out of state, and so letting them know what applies here. Um, which certainly when the nuisance house bylaw went into, was new, newly passed in 2008, is the increase in fines. We had a whole educational campaign about that. Um, retail partners, uh, oh yeah, that was a nuisance house. The retail partners, um, we have a retail partners committee on the CCC, and these efforts are all still underway. They've been going on for years. Purchase surveys, so to try to help retailers understand um, are, there, are there operators serving underage um, people? And this isn't meant to be a punitive measure, it's actually um, if, if they are caught serving a minor, um, you know, they're just, they're given a warning, and if they do the right thing, they're given a gift card, and so it's, it's really just meant to um, open their eyes to any problems that may be occurring at their establishment. Server trainings, there are reduced, um, there are trainings for both um, restaurant and bar operators as well as package store um, operators, and like I said, we have a committee early on, there were some um, forums with retailers, so there's a nice exchange of information and best practices. There's also, I guess, at the, at the landlord level, there are a number of strategies that we've developed um, and that are ongoing. Um, we try to hold an annual 
landlord meeting that brings together police, campus partners, <coughs> landlords, and property managers to make sure that we're on the same page, um, sharing information. We're consistent in our messaging to students because we're all we're all serve, you know we're all interacting with students in different ways. Um, there's a model lease agreement. There's judicial checks for landlords with our Dean of Students office. Um, a lot of properties, larger properties, have uh, implemented strategies to reduce uh, environmental crime. So things like having secure buildings and security on the premises, um, issues around you know, parking enforcement, emptying dumpsters before the spring so that you know to prevent fires from happening. So measures that they can take as a, as a living community to try to prevent um, crime or other damage. Um, so there's been a lot of successes. This just touches upon a few. I think at its core, as Sally mentioned, and just the opportunity for us to come together and have discussions and conversation about these issues is really important. Um, and now we're at a place, you know, eight years into it, um, we're looking at what's left. You know, it's, it's heartening to see many of us participate in webinars or conference calls um, about coalitions around the country, and it's really heartening to hear that we've actually implemented a lot of best practices a lot of effective strategies here, and yet we sit around saying, why are we still having all these problems, and what are we doing, um, what can we be doing better or more of? Um, and it's a daunting task. I mean, each year we have a new, new group of students that comes on board, we have um, the issues not going away, and drinking is always going to be prevalent in the community. And so we decided earlier, um, I would say maybe six months, nine months ago, we really wanted to hone in on like, what are the key issues that we're still facing and um, let's put together some work groups that can really focus in on, on that particular issue and come up with a set of recommendations for things that we can do both in the short term, meaning this spring, as well as maybe some longer term um, strategies. And so these are the issues that we identified as, as being really problematic in our community. So the issue around party management, particularly off-campus parties, um, we are fortunate, I mean, we have bars downtown, students go there, others go there, but we don't have quite the situation that some of the other college communities have where there's like, you know, bar row downtown with 10 bars and they can do party crawls. We really, our problems, um, you know, quite a few house parties, which you all know, so that's, that's a problem that we felt like we really need to spend time, and there are some strategies we're looking at in that area. Um, the party crawl, which is basically the roving group of students, which I'm sure many of you have encountered, as Sally mentioned, as they're going from one destination to the next, particularly when it's nice out, there's lots of issues with noise or public urination or trash or other problems. So we, we're sort of referring to that as the party crawl as they move from one place to the next. Um, pre gaming is certainly an issue where, you know, particularly for a lot of our students, 63% um, of our students live on campus, and so we have issues with students maybe pre-gaming, not just on campus, but wherever it may be, and trying to load up early so that they can go out and, and have a nice buzz. If they don't know where they might get their next drink, um, also cost is a, is a huge factor, so, um, so, so a lot of students will pre-game. And then we have a communications work group just looking, it kind of covers all of these issues, but you know what, how are we communicating with various audiences and how can we do it um, more proactively, more consistently. Um, so those are the key issues. In casinos, we just kind of put a question mark that hasn't really come into play much yet, but it's certainly an issue we'll be watching. And so this is just a list of some of the possible solutions. There are other things not up here that are, you know, we're still, our groups have been meeting since December, like December, January, February, and we're going to be convening this month and next to really figure out what can we do this spring, um, what requires maybe longer term, more time and more resources to plan. And so I put up just a few things that we're thinking about, but um, the work group on the party crawl is trying to it's come up with a couple ways that we might be able to redirect students from busy residential streets like Bering Street um, in, in that sort of intersection with Nutting and, and Lincoln. That's certainly an area where there's just you know high traffic, lots of noise. Um, so we've come up with a few strategies and hopefully we can do a couple things in the spring just to to try them out, see if, see what works. Um, again, targeted enforcement efforts. Um, the police force is working together, again, to do some targeted, targeted enforcement. Um, proactive communication about community standards, enforcement efforts, and the consequences. So communication, so if there are going to be um, 
you know, a heavy sh show of force of the police on a weekend, um, going around to parties, you know, being proactive and communicating that to students. I think we all feel like we're not out to get you. You know, that's not that's not really our goal. We, we'd rather say to them, hey, there's going to be heavy enforcement. We're going to be issuing nuisance house citations. Um, get ready for it. Expect to see it, and expect that you'll face consequences if you violate um, the laws. And so. Um, some proactive communication with students, and again, this, this idea of having coordination. We met early on in the spring with landlords, with the police, with campus partners, and that was really helpful. We were able to share information, share our messages, um, understand what each person was going to be, you know, each of those areas was going to be doing, and um, I think it really helped us have a, a pretty successful spring, and so that's something we'll, we'll be doing again um, so that we can. You know, again, it's all about coordination. This is a this is a intractable problem, community problem. So, um, like I said, the work groups continue to meet. Um, we would certainly welcome participation if anyone's interested. Like, um, we're hoping to come together this month and again see what's see what's feasible for this spring, and then um, continue to work on it through the summer and the fall to implement the things that, that need a little bit more time and, and development. So. I'm going to end there, and I think we're going to turn it over to um, a panel of a few CCC members who can also provide their perspectives on the co you know, working in the coalition and open it up to questions from you all. So thank you. So what, so what we thought we'd do is maybe just have the panel bring up a chair. And um, what we have with us today is um, Captain Chris Pronovos from Amherst Police Department, Lieutenant Tom O'Donnell from UMass Police, Stephanie O'Keefe, the Amherst Select Board Chair, and Akshay Kapoor, who is the Student Government Association President at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So what we ask each person to comment on just briefly is the value of the CCC um, in their work and perhaps what a greatest learning has been in, in the you know, continued involvement this work and so maybe if each panelist could address that really quickly and then we'll open it up to questions. Sure. Good morning, Chris Provost of the Amherst Police. Um, I've been involved in the coalition for about three years now and um, I think in terms of uh, you know the greatest um, achievement what the coalition does for the police department is that um, you know I've been working here for 23 years um, and you know, finally, uh, this is no longer just a police problem. Um, it's a community problem, and uh, there are many different entities involved in trying to find solutions to some of the issues that we have surrounding the uh, student population. So, um, a lot has changed, you know, in terms of that. Uh, you know, we can, uh, you know, certainly do quick fixes as police officers show up in noise disturbances, under drinking, and arrest as many kids as we possibly, you know, put into our cars and drive back to the station, but. Um, what's the what's the long-term effect of that? What do we really solve? And I think the philosophy now um, in the department is, you know, we are we're looking for something a lot better than that. Uh, we're looking for long-term solutions uh, because it has created a lot of issues for the department, um, especially in recent years. There's other areas that need our attention. Uh, most recently, the schools. Um, so, really, we're trying to spread our resources around. So the coalition. Uh, it gives us the ability to bring in uh, many different stakeholders from a really diverse area uh, to try to find solutions that we have no control over. There's only a certain amount of things that we as police officers can do. We certainly ratchet up education over the last several years, and as Sally said, um, you know, we don't like to um, jam someone up. We can help it, so we try to get the word out there. Uh, we have officers going door to door, literally, uh, during the busy times of the year, you know, trying to do some proactive um, enforcement, you know, trying to tell them, hey, you know, don't go out there because the chance of getting caught is going to be very, very high. Um, so we're doing those type of things, and the coalition gives us some um, ability to be able to do that, um, to be able to get our message out within the university and, you know, touch on different areas that we wouldn't have any control over. So um, that's been very helpful to us. Um, what have I learned? Uh, I think what we've learned from the police department through the coalition is that um, we all have a different um, we all have our different concerns or different areas of, of concern with uh, student high-risk behavior, drinking, 
um, protecting our interests, trying to, um, you know, they may be different, but the ultimate goal is the same, and that we really can help one another, um, as I said before, you know, reach the population. So uh, it's been good. It's been a good, um, good avenue. I think something as simple as what Sally said, you know, sometimes it's venting frustrations, you know, going in there and saying, you know what, we had a really bad weekend, and we got to do something. Um, you know, so it's been very positive from our perspective. Uh, we have we have a short amount of time, correct? So yeah, seven minutes. So I won't go. Seven minutes? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the value certainly is it works. Uh, I'm sorry. Hey, Sally, can you move the microphone? Yeah, stand up. Like you me. certainly can ask me to stand up. Yeah. Come over to the mic. Can you hear me, or is it just you need to see me? You just uh, I'm tall, so I don't need to see me. But, um, so the, the value of the coalition is definitely that it works. Um, that over our eight years, we've seen uh, high risk drinking decline. Uh, that we've made some really uh, positive inroads uh, with students and the uh, uh, initiatives that we have. Uh, you know, we've tried different things like have a heart, uh, joint patrols, um, met many things that uh, that we've done with students that I think have had a, had a uh, positive uh, impact on them. Um, and then the greatest learning, uh, certainly there's so many people that are uh, invested in the CCC. Uh, when I first started going there, um, just thought it would be another one of those groups. Um, now, seven, eight years later, uh, I'm still there. Uh, you know, Chris and I are there because of the police, uh, so we have a vested interest. And Sally was there uh, until recently in her role as UHS. But it's people like Stephanie that really um, uh, have shown me that it's not just a university uh, problem, but that it's a, a local problem. And uh, you know, Stephanie has been a great advocate for the town. But she's also been a great encourager for me and the university, um, especially when it comes to uh, realizing we're doing a lot more than we give ourselves credit for. And uh, I really uh, I thank Stephanie for always reminding me that in those meetings, because it is good to hear that uh, we are doing good things. It's unfortunate we're just not good at promoting uh, what we're doing. That's good. <laughs> I'm Stephanie O'Keefe, Chair of the Hammer Select Board. Um, I personally can't speak enough about the value of the coalition uh, in, in the work that I do. To me, the, it's really about the relationship building. It's about the fact that there are so many people there from so many different uh, parts of the university and from the town coming together jointly to uh, recognize, appreciate, and try and solve these problems. Uh, in, in my role with the town, uh, the, the effects of the uh, drinking behavior just it, it, it impacts everything. I mean, every every decision that we make at the town level, practically everything we bring before a town meeting, whether this is a long-term planning issue or whether it's a short-term issue of you know what the weekend is going to look like, it just impacts so many different areas. And to be able to work jointly with so many different folks from the university, to have so many different folks all there in the same room that you're getting to know that you are able to you know then call up reach out to uh, and share resources share um, share a, an approach to finding solutions it just it, it, it's meant everything um, I, I often say that you know the, the coalition started out as sort of like that that group that's dealing with high risk drinking behavior I actually think this is like the hub of town gown relations right now it's not Town gown relations isn't about you know the town manager and the chancellor meeting together in some nice office. This is about all of the stakeholders coming together to acknowledge and jointly address these issues, and I think it's been incredibly effective at that. Um, greatest challenges. One of the greatest challenges is, is as we've talked about, the fact that this uh, is an ongoing problem. Even though we have made so much progress, even though we are all devoting so many resources to this, it remains a problem, and that's just a reality. This is uh, one of the things I've learned is just as, as Sally's uh, slides demonstrated, how complex an issue this is. Um, and, you know, people are looking for us to, like, flip a switch, you know? Why don't you just X? Well, if it were that easy, <laughs> that switch would have been flipped a long time ago. Um, we really are taking such a comprehensive uh, approach to dealing with this in the town and the university side, but the problems continue. 
Um, so, so that challenge and the challenge that Tom mentioned, it's communicating how much effort both the town and the university are putting into this. Um, part of the problem in the community is there's this perception that people aren't doing anything. Why doesn't the town, you know, deal with the student drinking issue? Why doesn't the university discipline these students? Oh my goodness, it is so much bigger than that. So, so it really, we have a responsibility to be spreading that message much more because it's very dangerous for the community to perceive that we're not doing this work and uh, we really are doing a ton of work. So it, it's, it's incredibly satisfying to be working with great people and, and trying to find shared solutions here to a shared problem. Um, but it, it, as Lisa mentioned, it's a daunting task because the, the reality is the problem. My name is Akshay, I'm the student government president, and uh, luckily I've not been the council for eight years, it's been a very long college career, but it had been. But I got this year, and it's been great. Uh, like everyone else said, like what Stephanie said, uh, so it's been a great experience. Um, it's, the only, it's the only place where all stakeholders really do come together, uh, and it's rare. And we can do all that we want, we can all point fingers, we all have different perspectives, but it's not productive. We can go to the media, we can go sit in our back offices, but the fact is, once or twice a month we meet, and all stakeholders there are on the table, all over, and we can discuss the issue itself. We can openly discuss the issue, come with solutions, what we want to see in them. And that's rare for any setting, for any issue. So that's been an amazing experience for me. Because um, I probably was cynical about this issue beforehand, coming as a student, which is a group that I'm really proud to represent here on this council, and uh, we can really talk about some of those issues. And things that we get things done. Uh, we can get things done on all levels. We each represent different people, like I said. So we have a collective message. We go out there and we talk to the people that we represent. We can actually come to a solution, and you can see that the eight years that Sally mentioned, the rates have gone down, it is effective. It's not just a group working on relations to make new happen, but it's actually fixing the problem slowly. And we'll probably never fix it, but to the point that we, the best point that we can, it really does work in that sense. And it's in the optimism about this, issue, and I hope it continues on for a long, long time. And uh, I really do think it's the thing that Stephanie said about town and relations really has been. So it's been a learning experience for me at a lot of time. So go to the next one. <laughs> so I think we have about five minutes or so, three minutes? Yeah, two, two minutes. Questions. No, no, two questions. Two yeah. questions. I'll do shall and Yeah, I was just curious if when a student violates a, a town or a state law, the UMass system kicks in, does that apply to political protest as well? Like if they're sitting down for, let's just say, you know, anti part time. Uh, if, uh, if you're a student at the university and you're arrested by the UMass Police Department, and I would say also by the Amherst Police Department, that the name would get shared. Um, if you're not a student, the name wouldn't get shared with the Dean of Students Office. And then uh, they're still going to go through criminal justice procedures through the court or whatever it may be. Um, and then it's up to the Dean of Students Office if it was a violation of the Student Code of Conduct. Um, say thank you. I've been working here as a local landlord for about eight years, and I have also noticed the decline, especially when the joint ventures began. I also went to BU, and any house party there was always squelched about 1, 1 30, and both patrols would go. And my comment, or question rather, is when someone is arrested, is the police report sent directly to the dean's students? Because I know that's how it was handled at BU. That was number one. And two, just a comment from my current tenants. Um, I always grew up being afraid of the police if I were arrested. <laughs> um, my tenants aren't, they don't seem to be afraid of a police record or what it might mean. They don't understand that a record follows them. They are terrified of the dean of students office. <laughs> which is really interesting. <laughs> sort of thing, when I was in school, it didn't the Dean of Students Office didn't have as much effect as the police, and I was wondering if your group felt that from the students as much as they tell me. I think it's a, it's a two part question. I think I'll let Chris take the. Sure. Yeah. Um, to answer the first part, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, the, the, the uh, police reports are sent directly to the Dean of Students uh, where they're acted on, and the second part of your, your question. Um, she escapes me now. What was it? Oh, <laughs> scared of police. Oh, scared of police. Thank you. Um, she's absolutely correct. Um, students really are not afraid of police. You know, we'll show up and, you know, um, you know, the, the officers will tell you that it, it's, 
they'll give the attitude, it's, it's all right to party. Don't you have any better to do, blah, blah, blah. Which, unfortunately for them, is usually not the best way to handle it. Um, <laughs> they also have a lot of discretion in many cases. But, um, but yes, they are terrified of the dean's office. That's why you know, we've been saying that for years, and we're very happy that through the coalition, we now have that communication and the you know, uh, revisions in the student code of conduct. That, that's been huge for us. I, I can't tell you how, how important that's been. Um, that's truly what they're thinking about. The immediacy of how is this going to impact my university years. Um, they're not looking ahead, as, as we said. So it's a great point. Sally, you can get the board. Okay. Wow. All of a sudden, it's like popcorn. Do <laughs> uh, you have a sense for what uh, what percentage of students the drinking is happening on campus or off campus? That's a, it's a great question. What what we're finding is that um, drinking is pretty much on par on campus and off campus. Um, free gaming is happening on campus, so that's drinking in the residence halls before they go off campus. The place where they drink the most is typically at off campus parties. Um, but there's there's off campus parties. They're not drinking a lot at the bars. It, a lot of, and many of them travel with alcohol with them. So they'll just take a backpack, um, Chris will talk us about this, they'll take a backpack full of booze and just wander trying to find a party or create a party. Um, so one of the things we've been really you know, careful about is the displacement theory. You know, if you're really cracked down on the campus that you're gonna push it into the community. We're finding that, that it's everywhere. It's popping up in different places. So on the campus side, if we can reduce the pre-gaming so they're not drunk when they head out, that's gonna have an impact. And then in the town level, if we can make sure that the off-campus parties aren't out of control, then they're not gonna go back to the campus and cause disruption. So it's, it's, it's both places. The reason I'm being so bossy is I want Akshay to take. Boss. Yeah, I want Akshay to take credit for the sober yes. shuttle. Yes, tell us about the sober shuttle, Akshay. Yeah. Understand. All right. So um, ever since I came to UMass as a freshman, I was pretty amazed that we didn't have a sober driving alternative. Um, we all know that people will drink. We've done so much in this much of people from drinking beforehand. It's been successful for the most part. But we do nothing after the fact. Um, we can't leave students out there to be, and that impacts the entire community. I mean, pedestrians, other drivers on the road. And we can't ignore the fact that people do drink and drive. It's not just students, but at least for me, the um, for us at the campus, I want to make sure that we did something for students there. So my idea was creating a sober shuttle program. It was definitely not the first idea. I uh, said people before me I definitely tried it, but not in the same way, not as feasible as a way. So if you guys have heard the news recently, um, the program started two weekends ago. Last weekend was a storm. I had to cancel it. Um, <laughs> probably more dangerous on the bus at that point. But the program essentially is a, a, a BBTA bus driven by a student driver and a UMass police officer on board for safety. And we go to the downtown areas um, right after the buses stop running, which a lot of the buses, if you've seen them, they just have people away. They get overfilled. So those students specifically, they want to get a ride home safe and they want to really get them, which is it's awful. Um, so this bus goes down the downtown area, it picks up just there, and the first stop after actually after meeting with the CCC I realized was, let's can do two problems with one, let's try to fix the Bering Street problem with the noise. So I made sure it stops in Southwest, so people bypass Bering Street if they, want, if they want to, and it's a faster, much warmer way home if they want to take that, so that's a good incentive. But then it also goes, stops in the middle of campus, um, and hang a small, and then the major off-campus areas, including uh, North Apartments, which are, um, Mostly seniors and people are going to the bars. So it goes to the North Apartments, the Bobar, Puff Den, Brandy One, all the way down the road. It makes two loops, one at 1.20 and one at 2 a.m. So we've seen pretty high ridership already the first weekend. And I think it'll definitely grow as spring grows, people are more aware of it, like it's only been one weekend right now. But at the very least, it's an impact. It's done by students. I do want to emphasize that. It's paid for by students. It's incredibly cheap. They voted on it. The average student, believe it or not, they're not all bad. They want to fix these kinds of problems as well. And they voted for a fee increase actually to fund this program, which was only a dollar or so a semester, but they want to pay more to help solve this problem. So I do want to emphasize that. And we're taking it out of our hands as well. So. Yes, thank you. We just had a very successful winter fest on Sunday, and uh, about 80% of our volunteers were students. And maybe if we think of other events that we can get them involved in, I mean, what a great, you know, I mean, the event wouldn't have gone through if it wasn't for all of them. So if we can get them involved in things like this, you know, there was a couple of years being poured that day, but nobody was out of control. You know, they were involved, they were more involved in helping work with the project and everything else. Yeah, students certainly could be part of the solution. Akshay, uh, you know, has really shown that. 
with the Sober Shuttle. We're, we're really lucky that that has uh, gone off. And uh, listen, thanks for being bossy. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. I was hoping that you'd say it before, yeah. but it's, uh -huh. it's great that we got that information now. Um, on, you know, unfortunately, we don't have enough time for all the questions. And I just want to say thanks to the CCC, Sally and Lisa, for your leadership and the whole panel for, for being active participants. Um, this has really been uh, a, great, a great group. Um, making good and positive things happen. So more information is up at the front desk, and uh, maybe another time we'll have you in just a few questions. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you.